So good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I'll just start with today, just given the most recent figures. And unfortunately, as of today, nine more people have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19, bringing the overall figure to 338. And again, just on behalf of the executive, and I'm sure everyone, um, we pass on our sincere condolences to all of those families who have lost a loved one and who are grieving at this time. As an executive, our role is to support people through this crisis, making sure that people get the help and the support that they need. Yesterday, I brought legislation which passed through the Assembly to strengthen the protections to private renters during the COVID-19 crisis. And I thank my Assembly colleagues and the committee for dealing with this important bill so swiftly. It is our responsibility to alleviate the stress that people may be feeling through no fault of their own, with loss of employment and other pressures. And especially at this difficult time for so many, people should not have to worry about having a roof over their heads, as housing is a fundamental right. The food parcel service um, for those uh, most in need with no other access to food or support has been hugely successful in getting emergency food and essential supplies to those most in need. Since the service started on the 6th of April, more than 34,000 boxes have been distributed to 24 council distribution centres and onwards to people um, who have requested that support. This is one part of a broader food programme and I have asked my officials to take stock, to review our responses and adopt um, based on the change in needs of our people as we move through this emergency. My department continues to work with big food retailers in developing localised arrangements for an online system. The system being used in England can't be used here as we have a different health service database <coughs> arrangements. Given that any arrangement will involve sharing of names and addresses, there are a number of data assurance and data security measures that need to be put in place, which include consulting with the Information Commissioner's Office we are making good progress on this, and I will be making a positive announcement on this very soon. I hope people cannot, or sorry, for people who cannot leave their homes, a delivery service um, is available from a range of local businesses, and we have arrangements in place in each council area for volunteers to do shopping or collect prescriptions for those in need. This collaborative effort by many across our society to deliver food and to provide other essential services is heartening and truly demonstrates what, we can be, what can be achieved by working together with a focus on protecting people and particularly our most vulnerable. The COVID-19 uh, Contingency Fund provided £1.5 million through councils for 12 weeks for interventions on the ground, which also included local food support. Our social security system continues to deal with a huge volume of calls and claims, way beyond our normal capacity. And for example, earlier this week, our discretionary support service, which provides vital support to vulnerable people on low incomes and who find themselves in the most exceptional, extreme or crisis situations, received almost 10,500 calls in one day. This is double the number of calls that we normally receive in this service. And these key workers in the Department of Communities have implemented a number of interventions to manage this situation and to ensure that pensions, disability benefits and welfare supplementary payments continue to be paid to those who need them. I will publish more details on this in the coming days and how we have responded to supporting tens of thousands of people who have been unable to work and who have had to claim universal credit since this crisis developed. And it was important for me that nobody gets left behind. People had to get the money they were entitled to. The information I will release in the coming days will show how successfully we have managed to do that. And like so many who are working tirelessly, going above and beyond, answering calls, processing claims, ensuring that emergency aid is provided, volunteering in many different ways, I want to extend our sincere thanks to all of you for the exceptional public service that you are providing. And finally, I want to thank you for the effort each and every one of you are making to tackle the spread of this horrendous virus. 
And again, I appeal to you on behalf of the executive to continue to follow the public advice, continue the good example that you have been leading on over the last six weeks, continue to wash your hands, stay at home, observe social distancing, and only travel when it's absolutely necessary to do so. Gormila Mayogov. COVID-19 is a cruel, cruel virus and it has disrupted almost every aspect of our lives. And one thing that has remained steadfast throughout is the resilience of our people and our resolve and our, abil our ability to come together as that people to fight against this enemy. The death of my dad last week, of course, brings the importance of family and loved ones into sharp focus for me personally. And I know how hard it is for all of you not to do what comes most naturally. COVID-19 has robbed us of the very things that bring us joy. Seeing our loved ones, a tight hug, comforting a friend, visiting your family, having a traditional funeral and wake, not going to your church anymore, or out for an evening, the concert that you've wanted to go to, the sporting events, our lives have been turned upside down. And yet it is those very things that weaken our response. It is those things that allows this virus to spread and it is those things that we must avoid for our loved ones. As we move through the various stages of this pandemic, of course our response too must change. And in order to flatten the curve, restrictions have been put in place to slow down the spread of the virus and to give us all a fighting chance in reducing the number of loved ones that we actually lose. And this is the right thing to do. But the executive has also tried to take a pragmatic, practical and sensible approach to our new norm. In the last week, I have permitted people to walk through our forests and country parks in limited circumstances. And I've also written to our local, local councils to outline principles that can apply when deciding if it's safe to open household recycling facilities. The executive has also opened access to our cemeteries. The purpose of these actions is actually to help people cope and stay at home longer by letting people visit a loved one's grave, permitting exercise, allowing people to get fresh air, and helping people to keep busy at home, gardening and clearing out, all of which aid better mental health. Small steps like this do not mean we drop our guard or we take our eye off the ball. It is not business as usual. If you plan to undertake any of these activities, you must still observe social distancing. Only travel short distances to your cemetery, the forests or indeed the recycling centre, and only if you absolutely must. The battle is far from over, but we can already feel hope, triumph over despair. Our actions are making a dif difference. <clears throat> we see the number of admissions to our hospitals fall, and we hope to see the number of deaths fall on a very consistent basis going forward. So we must not risk undoing all the good work or create another wave. I and my department remain fully committed to helping our industry, our stakeholders, and the people of Northern Ireland get through COVID-19. The work we do touches everyone across our region, food, waste, fisheries, rural support and environment. Our sector has responded to the challenge in a remarkable way, never seen before. Innovative, innovative thinking, collaboration, and responsive action as well as grit and hard work have ensured we continue to have food on our tables, a functioning waste sector and a healthy environment. And while we would never have wanted it on these terms, much of the work done in response to COVID-19 has shone a light on new ways of working, on how we can do things better and find opportunities amid the challenges. As we look to a more positive future, I intend to hone in on some of the good habits we've developed as well as to try and strengthen, uh, strengthen the weaknesses that have emerged, including securing Northern Ireland's food supply lines between ourselves, the mainland and the rest of the world. We've already seen other nations across the world struggle to get food moving off farm and into the retail sector. And although the hard work and dedication of our local food sector and farmers means that we haven't had that problem, we must not be complacent. This is an important piece of work. We can win this battle. We must win this battle. We will win this battle. And better days lie ahead if we perse persevere a little longer.
Good afternoon, Ministers. Tracy McGee, uh, UTV. You will be aware that uh, there is concern among businesses about when the restrictions will be eased. And garden centres um, were raised twice during PMQs. Minister Poots, uh, condolences on the loss of your father. You yeah. also spoke there about uh, garden centres. Can you tell us whether or not there has been any discussion around the executive table about uh, easing restrictions and allowing garden centres to open soon? And what is the feeling among ministers on that matter? The executive has discussed um, reducing a number of restrictions uh, over the course of the last week. And the first uh, one that was carried out was, was a cemeteries, obviously. And uh, I believe that we can move forward in a graduated response, um, as opposed to have a big bang at some stage. And those things which cause the least risk, um, without losing the message, um, are things that we can therefore consider. Um, garden centres um, are facilities which you can practice social distancing in. They're, they're normally large facilities, um, and they normally have limited numbers. So you have garden centres of a couple of acres in size, and, and you could have maybe 50 people in them. So they, they are places where you can practice social distancing. Uh, I also understand that garden centres sell around 60% of their goods um, in April, May and June. And therefore, it is incredibly important to them that they have the opportunity to engage in business. And I know that many of them are engaging online, uh, but that will not make up for their loss of trade. Uh, the alternative for the executive to not opening garden centres um, over the course of the next number of days or weeks um, is that they offer a large compensation package um, to garden centres because the reality is that the materials that they have to sell are not materials that can be sold in July, August, September. They have a shelf life and that material will have to be thrown out. So your hanging baskets and your bedding plants and all of that there, if they're not sold very soon, um, then that will create a real problem and be an additional cost for the executives that we don't really need to pay. I suppose from my point of view, I mean, we have been clear um, and this is a, a tough time for communities, for families that haven't got to see each other um, over the past six weeks and obviously for businesses that are really struggling financially. Um, but I mean, I suppose it's to refocus around why these regulations were brought in and we recognise that they're draconian. But this is about saving lives and we can see that day on day lives continue to be lost as a result of this pandemic. I think that any change, we have always said and we've been clear that the regulations will be reviewed again week beginning the 4th of May. We know that the south of Ireland are also doing that in that week as well. And we will be led very much by the scientific and the medical advice. Because what is clear is what we don't want is a second spike or those figures starting to increase again. Because that will actually put the economy and put communities in a, in a more worse position. And we obviously need to manage um, the introduction or the relaxation of regulations. So in executive, we have given a commitment that we will look at that. That will be in week beginning the 4th. Um, that will be very much led by the medical and scientific advice. And we're obviously looking at uh, those areas that are a couple of weeks in advance of us and trying to learn from what's happening internationally. And we have seen in Germany where there was a relaxation. And again, we're learning from how we begin to relax, how we introduce those relaxations and the regulations. Because in Germany, when they started to do that, the virus reproductive rate rose from uh, 0 0.7 to 1. And obviously, we don't want that. We want to make sure that we suppress any increase in this virus, because an increase in this virus means death. And there's no other simple way or easy way of saying that. And obviously, we want to do all that we can to reduce that whilst we know these draconian measures do need to be monitored on a regular basis. But there is a clear commitment of the executive that we, start, we will look at that on week beginning the 4th of May, um, and hopefully through a coordinated plan, looking at the medical advice, looking at the modelling um, that has taken place, that we can start to do that in a managed way and in a way that reduces the risk to the loss of life in the time ahead. Good afternoon, Ministers. Um, to Edwin Putz, your colleague Paul Given has called for the controlled opening of church buildings as well. So I wonder, is that something that the executive has discussed as part of these measures to lift some of the lockdown? And um, to Deirdre Hargey, um, you talk there about the universal credit. 
I wonder, can you give us a figure though? Um, you'd mentioned last month about the number of calls and, and applications that have been processed, but it'd be good to see what the actual figure in terms of those applications right now is. Thank you. Yeah, I suppose on the universal credit one, I'll go first. Um, there's been just over 57,000 new claims in the last five weeks. Um, so that has obviously been unheard of um, in terms of the claims that we have received. Just in a conference call with my departmental officials on the 27th of April, there were 850 additional new claims. So obviously there is a huge demand still. People are struggling financially, obviously through lost income or no income at all. Um, and they are moving towards the social security system. Obviously we have put plans in place to ensure that firstly, people are paid, that they get the financial income um, that they need at this time. And obviously through discretionary support as well, we have paid out over 1.3 million um, in emergency financial support to those um, who need it at this point. So up until now, we have been responding well. Uh, people are getting paid on time, but there's no doubt that this has had a huge impact um, on the social security system. And obviously we'll continue to manage that as we try to manage our way through this crisis and into a period of recovery. Mental health was a significant problem before COVID-19, and that remains to be a significant problem. Uh, and it's one that I believe is growing as a consequence of COVID-19, uh, with many people not engaged in activities that they previously engaged in. So we will carry out those assessments, and we are carrying out those assessments. And as Deidre said earlier, um, this will be based on, on the, the medical advice and scientific advice. Um, but where there's little prospect um, of there being a spread, and, and we, we have this, this R, R figure, and the R needs to be less than one, uh, because it was previously almost three before lockdown. Um, where we have th this figure of being less than one, COVID is in reverse. And, you know, I attend a church, for example, where there's seven, 700 seats in it. Um, if, if we can facilitate, you know, social distancing, can we do it? That's a reasonable question to ask. If you have a church where you can't facilitate social distance and the people want to come together, can you do it in drive-in churches, for example, so people don't get out of their cars and, and they listen uh, to the service to the radio, but they still gather? Um, those are all questions that we as an executive have to look at. You know, I need to look at whether we can permit angling once again. It's a very solitary um, sport that people engage in. Um, they walk down the, the side of a river, they, they do that on their own. So all of these things where there is little impact you know, those are the things that we can graduate at a certain point. Obviously, the opening of pubs and restaurants and, um, you know, sporting activities that involve contact and all of those things, those are going to take considerably longer. Uh, but we needed to put the harsh restrictions in at the outset so that people got the message, and particularly the message on social distancing. Now that they've got the message, I believe that um, we can keep people with us uh, by having a graduated response to it and ensuring that uh, we do not put at risk or in jeopardy um, any further um, rise in, in, in this coronavirus or indeed a second wave of it, um, whilst giving people a little more latitude uh, to engage in some of the activities that they prefer to engage in. Minister Poots, um, you, you've been talking there about some of the areas in which we maybe will start to phase out these restrictions. Um, and it, it, it seems logical that whenever you start to relax these restrictions, there will inevitably be a certain element of pent up demand. And so we've had these reports of thousands of people um, going to cemeteries over the weekend as soon as that restriction was lifted. Maybe garden centres, perhaps if they were opened up, people who wouldn't ordinarily go there might suddenly think, actually, if that's the only place I can go, I'll go there, I'll buy some plants. How do you start to manage this um, whenever in one area you relax this, that, that, that you don't have a flood of people coming together and that creates difficulties? And for Mr. Hargy, um, we know now that Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK which um, does not have these online priority slots for the vulnerable, for the elderly, for supermarket shopping. And um, you've mentioned data protection difficulties there, and of course that's understandable, but how is it that Northern Ireland hasn't been able to overcome that and England, Scotland and Wales have been able to do that? Well, in terms of cemeteries, there's, there's thousands of cemeteries, so thousands of people attending cemeteries isn't, isn't particularly shocking. Um, and I would expect that uh, people in cemeteries were very well able to engage in social distancing and that there wasn't any problems with people coming into contact with each other 
um, as a consequence of the executive decision. The decision which was recommended by the chief medical officer, uh, I might add. Now, you do raise a point which has validity in that if you encourage some people, they'll take liberties. Uh, but let's be honest, we need to be you know, providing the support for the vast majority of people and those people who'd want to take liberties um, leave that to the police to deal with. The vast majority of people have been responsible. Let's, let's be very clear. In terms of the public response to coronavirus, the public has been hugely responsible. And having stuck this for, we're now into the sixth week, having engaged in this for six weeks, I don't believe giving the public small steps back to normality, very small steps, baby steps, that all of a sudden people are going to become irresponsible. The people who were irresponsible, uh, who would be irresponsible in those circumstances, are irresponsible before. So throughout COVID, there has been irresponsible people holding house parties. There has been irresponsible people who have been um, organising events and so forth. That's not appropriate. But we do not deal with, with, with the people who are, with the wider public, uh, by taking the view that they're responsible might have in such circumstances. It's how the wider public will actually respond. And I believe that the wider public have got the message, will continue to practice the message, that they have to take precautions that they previously wouldn't. Some of those precautions are staying at home. Um, others is about social distancing when you're not in your own home. And I believe that people have got that message very, very clearly, that beyond us, people are still going to stay in their homes an awful lot more. Some people have to go to work. Some people have to go to business. Some people um, will really want to go to that local cemetery or that local park for a walk, but they can do that with social distancing when they're not staying at home. I think, firstly, um, the number of people who have unfortunately died as a result of this virus is not as high as was initially anticipated. And that's twofold because the public have been adhering stringently to the public health messaging. And I think also because of the regulations that were introduced. I think there is a concern, whilst we have said, obviously, that we are going to review these regulations week beginning the 4th of May, now is not the time for complacency. The concern would be that if you start to knee-jerk without a planned um, relaxation of the regulations, that you could set that figure to go in the opposite direction again and in a direction that we don't want it to go in, because that could mean a loss of life. So the public have been amazing and adhering to the public health message and up until now. I am asking them again on behalf of the executive to continue to work with us over the next couple of weeks in terms of staying at home, only travelling unless it's absolutely necessary and to make sure that you're washing your hands um, as well. Um, and I do think that if they do continue to do that until the medical and scientific advice tells us that we can relax the other measures, then we will continue to do that. But I am asking the public to adhere to that advice because the work that you have been doing is saving lives here. Um, and I want to commend everyone uh, for following that and for saving lives. The other issue around supermarkets, and um, it is unfortunate that it has taken a bit longer. The reason is, is that when you look at England, they have one health database where all of those that are in the healthcare system, um, all of those that engage with the healthcare system are in one database. Here, we have over 350 databases which are located in local GP surgeries. That has taken a bit of time. Obviously, surgeries are under immense pressure at the moment, um, just with the social distancing measures that they've had to introduce. And also, people maybe not going to A&E, they're then going to their local doctors. Um, and so it's taken a while for them to get that information back into the Department of Health and also the Department of Communities. We have also had to engage with um, the Commissioner in terms of data sharing because there are data protection issues that we have to adhere to. And of course, also working with supermarkets where they can sign up the agreements around the data then that they receive. And I know that that's even presented difficulties in England where some retailers have not signed up to those as, as of yet. But there has been good engagement and I am hopeful to make a positive announcement on this very shortly, um, that we will have those mechanisms in place, that there will be um, additional capacity within the retailers or at least a realignment of their existing capacity and where we can start to open up this service 
um, to local people. But I have to say that that won't cater for everyone. Um, initially, when we were looking at this, there were 40,000 people that we understood were receiving shielding letters. That has now been up to over 80,000 people who are on shielding letters, and obviously the capacity <coughs> wouldn't be there by retailers. So it is important that we offer the online slots, but there are also local retailers in our arterial routes, in our villages, in our towns, that are now doing home deliveries. And we're also working with the community and voluntary sector, with local councils where volunteers can also go and get shopping for people uh, who need that service and who don't have the other support. So it is important that people engage with those other existing services. But I am hopeful to make a positive announcement on the online retail spots uh, in the coming days. Um, hello, good, good, good afternoon. It's Michael McHugh here from the Press Association. Uh, and Minister Pitts, con condolences on your loss. You. Uh, you said earlier this month that farming was in crisis. I, I just wondered, you know, having had a period to look at it, how many jobs do you feel are at risk? And what is the worst case scenario that, that you envisage? Yeah, the agri-food sector employs 100,000 people. Um, so if we see a contraction, we'd see it, certainly see a contraction in jobs. And um, this moment in time, we're probably looking at um, milk um, dropping in, in, in price uh, to uh, a loss-making scenario. And the uh, same will apply with, with beef and lamb in particular. So in all of those areas, if we see that contraction take place, and, and I would expect that to be the case on this, um, there is some support comes forward for the farming community uh, to ensure that uh, 10 million people that they feed um, you know, across uh, Northern Ireland, the UK and, and the world, um, that, then, then we're going to have a problem. And a 10% contraction in agriculture is 10,000 jobs. It's as simple as that. Uh, so we need to ensure that we don't have that contraction and that the, the growth that we have seen in the agri-food sector is something um, that we can pick up on the other side of coronavirus once again and ensure that, that those markets remain strong. The biggest problem that agri-food has at the minute is that 40% of its market was in food service and that um, basically closed overnight. Retail has not been capable of, of picking up all of that, and uh, therefore it has caused huge distortion. So, for example, in the red meat sector, um, those uh, cuts of meat that you would normally buy whenever you're out at a restaurant for a meal, the steaks, for example, the higher value cuts of meat um, are, are not selling particularly well at this moment in time. The milk sector, we were supplying a lot of the airline industry. Um, all of the, the, the shops that are selling the, the coffees, uh, they're closed, so people aren't drinking as much uh, nice milky coffees and so forth. So these sectors are being very badly and disproportionately hit, and they have came towards the end in terms of what their needs actually are. Uh, but just because you're at the, the back of the queue uh, doesn't mean uh, that your needs are any less uh, when it comes to providing support to get agri-food over the coronavirus. Um, other businesses have got that support and help to get beyond coronavirus, and I think it would be absolutely shameful if agriculture did not get support to get to the other side of coronavirus and um, rekindle that vibrant industry uh, that existed uh, before all of this happened. Hello, Ministers. It's Gillie Beatty from the Daily Mirror, Northern Ireland. Um, the Ministry for Communities has done excellent work on food poverty since the COVID-19 crisis hit Northern Ireland. But I'd like to ask the Minister what progress there has been on the Chancellor's £750 million package for charities, which was announced on April the 8th, and the £22 million Barnet consequentials that Northern Ireland received. And in answering that, I'd also like to know if it will all be allocated to support charities who have lost their fundraising income streams, and if so, when? Yeah, well, I suppose there's been huge work done um, throughout the community and voluntary sector, and obviously I want to commend them as a community activist myself for the sterling work um, that they have been doing and really meeting need. But importantly, working with my department through the community and voluntary sector emergency leadership group and identifying that need and trying to plug um, the gaps where they appear. The funding, I'm still in discussions with the Minister of Finance. We're obviously just finalising that. It's a huge piece of work, obviously, to analyse the impact 
um, the COVID-19 is having on local charities um, and uh, areas like local hospices, for example, that are looking at end-of-life care uh, scenarios for people. So we are hopeful that we will start to make progress this week um, in bringing something to the executive. And then over the coming weeks, looking at the wider issue, we will be continuing to engage with NICFA and through that community um, and voluntary sector emergencies leadership group to look at the, uh, the longer term impact on the community and voluntary sector and what mitigations or what recovery plans we can put in place um, to help them in, in this time. We have put in interim plans, the 1.5 million uh, community fund that goes through the council, over 500,000 invested in local sports organisations, 1.5 million in the arts, and indeed, as you said, over 10 million in dealing with the issue of food poverty. But there's a lot more work to be done, um, and I'm hopeful uh, with the support of my executive colleagues uh, that we'll uh, implement and, I suppose, announce more plans in the coming days and weeks.